Okay, the purpose of this video is to introduce some concepts associated with pulse width modulation, and in particular to look at um, what happens uh, to a pulse width modulated signal, or a signal when you pulse width modulate it, and uh, look at that in the frequency domain. That helps you understand the issues associated with reconstructing that signal. And we will do this basically using MATLAB to characterize the pulse width modulation waveforms and uh, their Fourier transforms as well as their reconstruction. The reason for this is that pulse width modulation is not an easy thing to do analytically or to analyze analytically. And so in order to get some idea of what's going on, we're going to do it using MATLAB. So to give you uh, a more exact idea of what it is we're about, Suppose we have some signal x of t. This is a signal that we're interested in. And this signal goes into a pulse width modulator. And out of this signal, or out of the pulse width modulator comes a pulse width modulated signal. And we'll show in a minute what this actually means when we get to using MATLAB. We'll actually pulse width modulate a signal with MATLAB and see what it looks like. And then quite often, once I've got the pulse width modulated signal, I want to reconstruct it. And the thing that comes out, I'll call x hat. OK. so. You may ask yourself, why on earth would I want to do something like this? This seems kind of kind of goofy. Well, let me give you a few real-world examples, or at least quasi-real-world examples. So quite often, this part of the system will be implemented by a microcontroller. And so, for example, the microcontroller might have some inputs that are uh, monitoring the state of a device or a motor or something like that, and the uh, microcontroller uh, determines what control signals need to be sent to the motor. It has a pulse width modulator on board, so it sends these um, uh, control signals actually to a power amplifier. So this is a microcontroller. Oh. plus maybe a power amplifier. And pulse width modulation is uh, quite popular for these sorts of applications because you can amplify pulse width modulated signals accurately with much lower power losses in the power amplifier than you can with a lot of other approaches. And then the reconstruction thing might be a motor. So the idea is uh, this pulse width modulation, or the, the controller and the power amp generate some, or have some signal x that they want the motor, maybe this will be a velocity profile for the motor. This gets pulse width modulated into the motor, or into the, yeah, it gets pulse width modulated, amplified, and run into the motor, and we want to see what comes out. Or sometimes, um, for example, pulse width modulation is a cheap way to get microcontrollers to create sound. So you may be in the process of having a microcontroller that's building sound effects. And then um, the output, or the reconstruction filter in this case, would be a cheap filter. Or it may actually even be just a, a cheap speaker. So this might be one of the things that you see. I don't know if you've ever received one of those really obnoxious greeting cards where you open it up and it sings happy birthday to you with some really obnoxious uh, song. Um, that might actually just be a small microcontroller and then a really cheap speaker. So in any case, this is something that's fairly interesting uh, in the sense that uh, it gets used quite a bit. And uh, we'd like to look at it in the frequency domain to understand what happens when we go from this x, x of t, to a pulse width modulated signal, 
look at that and see that we understand that, and then look at what happens under various different approaches to reconstructing it. So we'll switch over to MATLAB and uh, see what we can do to illustrate this. Okay, so here we have MATLAB, and I have created a function, a MATLAB function, that pulse width modulates a signal. And uh, I will make this uh, pulse width modulated, or this function that pulse width modulates a signal available on the companion website to these videos. Uh, I do it without providing any warranty. Uh, it's been tested for about 10 minutes. So far I haven't broken it, but I haven't tried very hard. So don't do anything with it that requires it to work, because uh, if it breaks, uh, I, it, it may well break. Uh, there's no guarantee or warranty associated with it. So in order to use this function, we need to create the x of t, the signal that we're going to pulse width modulate. And because MATLAB is part of a computer, everything that happens in it is done in terms of samples. And so what I'll do here is define a sampling frequency for my signal x that's going to go in to the pulse width modulator. So I'll uh, put in 20 samples per second. And then I need to create a vector of t values. Uh, these t values are going to be the time index for x. So I want them to be separated by 1 over fsx, that is the interval between samples is 1 over the sampling frequency. And I want it to go to 10 seconds. And then I'll create a signal here. I'll just create a sine 2 pi t. So this is a sine wave with a uh, fundamental frequency of 1 hertz. So having done that, I should now be able to plot the time waveform. And here it is. Ta-da! It's a sine wave looking exactly like we wanted it to. Okay, so here's the sine wave. The next thing I will do is um, run this through my pulse width modulation uh, uh, function. To do that, I need to have a pulse width modulation frequency. Um, this is the frequency whoops, of the pulses that uh, I will use to do the modulation. And so I'll have this be modulated at 20 hertz. Okay. And then I need a sample frequency for the output of the pulse width modulator. And I'm going to set this to 2000. That's probably overkill, but what this means is that every pulse will be represented by 100 samples, which is about, you know, that's probably enough. Okay, and then I need to have a time base for the output. I'm calling the output of my pulse width modulation y in this uh, in this uh, uh, MATLAB. So I'll put a time base together for y. Ty goes from 0 to, it's incremented by 1 over fsy, and it goes up to 10 seconds. Okay, so now I can say y is equal to pwm. This is my function that does pulse width modulation. The vector x, the sampling frequency for x, the pulse width modulation frequency and the sampling frequency for y. And it will take x, it will resample it at the uh, sampling frequency for y and then pulse width modulate it. And so with any luck, I've done that. So let's plot the signal going in again. This is t and x. And now we'll plot the pulse width modulated signal coming out and see what we get. So if we bring this up here, you can see we get kind of a mess. But if we expand it out, and in fact, if we zoom in on, uh, say, one, a little bit more than one cycle of our sine wave, you can see that everywhere the sine wave is zero, I have pulses that are about, that are one half the time and zero half the time. Everywhere that the sine is close to 1, I have pulses 
that are 1 almost all the time and 0 almost none of the time. Anywhere that I have uh, my sine wave be less than 1, down at negative 1, that's the minimum value it can take, I have pulses that are 0 almost all the time and 1 almost none of the time. So this green guy represents the pulse width modulated signal of this sine wave. So the next thing to do then is to plot uh, the spectrum, in this case the uh, magnitude spectrum, of this pulse width modulated signal y. Because we want to uh, see what it looks like in the frequency domain. So to do that, I create a, um, a frequency base. And basically, um, if this doesn't make sense to you, you should watch the video on plotting spectra with MATLAB. That will help. Uh, this two or 20,000 number that I just typed in is the number of samples in Y. Okay, so I've created something for the frequency base. Now I do the um, Fourier transform of... Uh, my um, pulse width modulated signal. And when I plot this, I get the following figure. And there you have it. <coughs> Excuse me. It shows that um, I've got a fairly large spike at zero, and then I've got s lots of stuff uh, going out even to a thousand hertz, even though, um, whoops, I don't know what happened there. Wow, I just broke something in a very serious way. Okay, well, let's replot this, see what happens. Okay, so. Um, I've got stuff out to 1,000 hertz, which is a pretty large frequency spread given that my input uh, frequency was 1 hertz and my pulse width modulating frequency was uh, 20 hertz. So if you zoom in a little bit, you can see that I still have, uh, well, I have a spike at zero, which represents a DC component, which has been added to the signal. And then I have uh, two spikes at 1 and minus 1. This represents the original sign. And then clustered around 20 and negative 20, I have a bunch of stuff. And that's a consequence of the pulse width modulation. So that basically gets us to the point where we can look at the spectrum of the pulse width modulated signal and we can um, uh, see what it looks like uh, clearly. It does a lot of complex things. I'm out of time, so we'll talk about how to reconstruct this signal in the next video.